<laughs> it's good to have you join us today. Um, not long before COVID-19 struck and schools were shut down, there was a young mother who went to pick up her first grade son. And um, he jumped in the car and she asked, well, how was your day? And he said, well, it was, it was pretty good. And she goes, oh, what, anything happened? She, he said, well, I got in trouble maybe three or four times. And she kind of gave that sideways glance like, hmm, there's more to this story that I want to discover. And he said, well, at the beginning of school, at the beginning of the class, I, I was kind of talking too much, and my teacher moved my desk to the front. But that was okay, because... We got to sit next to each other, and I like being near my teacher. And the mom said, oh, okay. Yeah, and at, at, at recess, I got into a fight with Tommy. And, but we went to the principal's office, and we talked about it, and we apologized to each other, and the, and the principal sent us back to class. So that worked out really well. Okay. So later in the afternoon, after, after, um, after lunch, I got up, it was during math time, and I, my teacher was talking at the chalkboard, and, and I was just like bored. So I, so I went to the back of the class, and I started talking to a couple of my friends, and my teacher gave me a detention. Oh. But everything kind of worked out at the end, because when school was over, my teacher called me to her desk and said, um, do you have any brothers or sisters? And I said, no. And she goes, yes. But that just shows how much she likes me. You know, there are times when we might get it wrong. We think we understand all the social cues, and we think we understand how things are going and what to expect, but we might be mistaken. And it's that way with a particular word that has probably become somewhat ostracized in the last few years. Uh, we don't, this word does not come up generally in regular conversations. You wouldn't have a group of people at a party and use this word. Because if you use this word, probably people would look at you kind of askance and maybe quickly try to find someone else to talk to. The word is righteousness. And righteousness is uh, an old-fashioned word. It's antiquated. Probably most people feel like the word righteousness is past its prime, that it's no longer really necessary to use in a regular conference. It feels kind of judgmental, critical, maybe even condescending. So when, if you hear the word righteousness in a social setting, you'd probably feel a bit uncomfortable, or most people would feel a little uncomfortable. It's kind of a Bible word or a churchy word. It's not a classroom word or a workplace word or, or something that you would use um, when you're having, having a discussion about um, a political discussion. You wouldn't talk about righteousness. And yet righteousness or morality is probably one of the number one characteristics that people, it is the number one characteristic that people look for in terms of whether or not they're going to maintain or develop a long-term relationship. We may not want to use the word righteousness or morality, but we care about that in the relationships that we develop. We want righteous people that we work with. We want our, our classroom to have righteousness in it. When we marry someone, we want a righteousness to that person because we can trust them. We, we want to see integrity. We want to see um, morality. We want to see trustworthiness. We want to see dependability. We like righteousness in our relationships, but we don't like to use the word righteousness because it doesn't feel appropriate. It kind of feels a little judgmental. Now, if what you mean by righteousness is what you do doesn't match who you are inside, that's not the biblical perspective of righteousness. That form of righteousness you probably could just discard. Don't have anything to do with that. But when the Bible talks about righteousness, it's generally describing the work of God in bringing into us His character, His qualities, His, His morality, His morality. 
so that we, as he becomes a part of us, we begin to have his ideas about how life should operate, his integrity, his morality, his pureness, his goodness, his kindness, his forgiveness, his, his, um, the qualities that make up God. When he becomes a part of us, they start to become a part of us also. And so what happens is that seed of God is planted in us, and that's essentially what being born again is, is God transforms us from the inside out because he becomes a part of us and changes us, and we develop his characteristics because his personality becomes a part of us. And so when, when that seed is planted in us, what the fruit that is born are the qualities that are the characteristics of God. So when we have been transformed by the power of God and made into a new person through him, then we begin to shift and our behavior begins to change. But it's matching what's inside of us, and so there's not a disconnect between our outward appearance and our inward being. Now, there's a character in the Bible, a personality, that probably is important for us to study. Um, he was the first king of Israel. He was a reluctant
foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. See, Saul had made the excuse. He said, well, you weren't here, and the men were leaving, and I had to do something. If you had, if you had waited, he, meaning God, would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. And you may say, well, that's rather a harsh assessment. I mean, Saul just kind of made a small mistake. I mean, the sacrifice was going to be made. Why couldn't Saul make the sacrifice himself? But God was establishing a kingdom, and he was laying the foundation for a, for a country that would be the example for the rest of the world. So God's plan was that a righteous nation would be built, and that righteous nation would be the example for the rest of the world. That the, na- the other nations would come and see um, the relationship they had with their God, um, the, the, the quality of life that they were experiencing, um, the kind of ethics and morals that were in that nation. And they would want to have what the nation of Israel had. And so the, the work, what God was attempting to do was to create with the nation of Israel an example for the rest of the world and a, draw, a magnet for the world to come to him and experience the, the, the transformation that God would bring to each one of these other nations. And so it was important for the first king to set the example for what a king was like. He was laying the, found, the king was laying the foundation for future kings. How is a king to behave? Nobody knew what a king was to do, at least a, a king of Israel under the leadership and the lordship of God. But, but now this first king, it was critical that the first king set the standard for all the kings that were going to come. And not only that, the king was laying a foundation for the rest of the nation. He was, um, he was setting the example for everyone about how to live a godly life. And as the king went, so would the nation. Um, we see this in social media uh, where, where people are called influencers, Every group has an influencer, and usually it's the primary leader. A club has an influencer. A PTA has an influencer. Uh, Classrooms have an influencer. The police association has an influencer. Trade unions have influencers. Corporations have influencers that impact the way the total company feels. An entire country has a leader who can be an influencer. Churches certainly have influencers. So Saul was an influencer. And God wanted the primary influencer of the nation to set the example of what godliness was, what righteousness was. And right off the bat, Saul was disobeying God. He was following his own thoughts, making making decisions that were in contradiction to what the Lord had said. So there was another test that came to Saul, and that is that um, the Amalekites was a nation that had um, tried to prevent Israel from coming into the promised land after Israel had spent the 40 years in the wilderness. And it was the Lord's determination that the Amalekites needed to be eliminated. Um, He didn't want any more memory of the Amalekites we just have to assume that their behavior was so bad, their morality was so terrible, um, their, their corruption was enough that God didn't want their influence for the nation of Israel, didn't want the threat of the Amalekites for the, for the Hebrew nation. And so God told um, Saul, wipe out all the Amalekites. And not just the Amalekite people, but every living thing that belongs to the Amalekites no sheep, no cattle, no donkeys. I want them all destroyed. So Saul gathered his army, and they marched up against the Amalekites. They destroyed the Amalekites. But then some of Saul's advisors probably came to him and said, Saul, you know, some of these sheep are really good. Cattle, man, they'd be perfect for us. Why don't we just save some of the best of the cattle and the sheep? Uh, we could offer them as a sacrifice. We could have a barbecue for all the men. 
The men could worship the Lord and thank God for this great victory that we just had. And, and it will be a win-win. And Saul thought about that. And he, well, that sounds like a great idea. The only problem was, of course, that God had said, don't leave any of the cattle or the sheep alive. Destroy them all. God didn't want there to be even the hint of the Amalekites brought into the, Hebrew, into the, Israel, the nation of Israel. So he saved some of the sheep, some of the cattle, and he offered sacrifices, and the men celebrated, and, um, and it was a great time. They worshiped God. They thanked the Lord for the victory. And then Samuel arrived. And Samuel hears the sheep. He hears the cattle. And he goes to Saul. What have you done? Saul said, well, um, we thought that it would be a great idea to honor God by saving some of the best of the sheep and the cattle and offering them as a sacrifice. And we can thank the Lord for what he has done. Samuel's response to... Um, Saul was probably not exactly what Saul was expecting. It's one of the strongest. In Scripture, one of the most famous, certainly, maybe in all of literature. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, it says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination. In other words, rebellion is like practicing witchcraft. It's like inviting demons into your worship. Um, God is implying, not, not implying, he's directly stating that when you don't obey him, when you don't do what he says, you're having fellowship with the demonic realm, with, um, with forces of evil and, and dark places. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. What happened soon after that is Saul's personality began to disintegrate the connection in the scripture between how he, he was internally, the changes that, that happened, there's a direct correlation between his disobedience to God and how he became after that. Not too long afterwards, he fell into a tremendous depression. Uh, his mood swings would be uh, immense. He would become angry and full of rage at one moment, and then he would become morose and full of despair at the next. Um, he struggled with trust. He became paranoid. He didn't believe anyone really wanted him to be the king. Um, he was constantly looking around for clues to see if people had uh, turned away from him. And so the, the personality of Saul began to disintegrate. Now, what was the cause of that? The only, the only explanation we have in the Scripture is that he was impacted by a demon force that was influencing his, his inner being. And I realize that we have been trained to think of when, when there, is, there are problems within, um, that the cause is due to a psychological factor or maybe sociological factors, um, genetic factors or biological factors. But we never really think of the spiritual component to the inward falling apart of the personality. But the Bible insists that that also can take place that spiritual forces of evil can have a tremendous effect upon our personality, our emotional responses to situations that we face. In the case of Saul, it clearly was happening that the breaking apart of his inner world was directly connected to Saul disobeying God and then opening himself up 
to demonic forces that began to operate within him. Now, in contrast to Saul, we see the second king of Israel, David, who um, from, an early, from an early age was obedient to God. He followed the Lord's instructions. He was faithful. He trusted God in difficult situations. He called out to God when he, when he was struggling with, uh, with a lion or a bear. He, he believed that God would take care of him. He was faithful to the Lord. He worshiped God. Uh, he trusted in him. And his, and his inner, his inner per, his personality reflected the sort of obedience, the structure of obedience that David maintained in his lifestyle. So David was, was, a, was a, a courageous, a, um, a faithful, a trustworthy person, an honest individual. Um, he, he cared about others. The quality of his personality was, um, was very attractive because his inner world was stable and full of peace. And it was directly, and it could be directly attributed to the relationship that he had established with God, that the Lord was the master of his life and God was the one who was his protector and the one he trusted. So you have David, and his personality is um, the, this one of peace and confidence and hope. And Saul, his personality is, is breaking apart. And he's struggling with the depression, and he's struggling, he's, he's having problems with the, the bursts of anger, and it, and it was just too much. The people, his, his advisors and his friends said, you need to do something about this. And they'd heard about David, and so they, they told Saul, you know, why don't you have David come and, and play his harp? He's a musician, he's a composer, he's a singer. Why don't you have him come to the palace, and maybe by playing his harp, you might relax. You might find some peace. And so that's what happened. David came to the palace. Um, Saul, Saul would be upset, frustrated. David would play his harp. Saul's um, mood would change, and he would become calm after maybe he had been raging or full of discouragement or despair or depression. So David had the impact of changing through his own personality, changing the personality of Saul in key moments of Saul's life. Now, it didn't last because Saul became jealous of David and drove David away. But, I, but, you, but you need to notice the connection between David's lifestyle of righteousness and obeying God and the inner world, the inner workings of David's personality of being positive, being trusting, being righteous, being kind and generous, and being faithful. Now, there's another individual that you see in the Bible, and he's famous for two different things. One is the terrible things that happened to, it, to him, and the other is the kind of lifestyle, lifestyle that he developed. Job has a book of the Bible named after him, um, and he was known for his, for his behavior, his moral uprightness, his righteousness. Um, he was so good, in fact, that Satan noticed him <clears throat> and brought to God's attention uh, Job and said, you know, Job is good. I understand Job is good. He's, um, he's morally upright. Um, he follows you. He's loyal to you. But I think if Job's world fell apart, I think Job's loyalty could be, um, be ruined. His, his devotion to you would be cut off. And the Lord said, okay, let's see. So Satan had Job's sons and daughters killed. He took away... <clears throat> Job's cattle, he, he destroyed Job's finances, his cattle, his sheep, his land, his, his ownings, what, his financial stability. He, he ruined it for Job. And even then, Job 
still was faithful to God, still trusting the Lord that he would work everything out for him and for his good. So then Satan went back to God and said, well, you know, if I, if I hurt him physically, then he's going to reject you. He'll rebel against you. He's not going to stay faithful. And the Lord said, okay, you can do that, but you just can't kill him. And so instantly Satan went out and inflicted Job with all these terrible sores that were all over his body. And even though Job um, was wondering why God had done this to him, and his friends were telling him, insisting that, that God had, was punishing him for his bad behavior, and Job knew that he had been good, that he had been a righteous man, that he had done what the Lord wanted him to do, um, even though Job was wondering why would God do this and he wanted to have an audience with God, he still remained faithful to God. He still maintained his integrity. He still continued to, to be, if we can, we can express it this way, he still continued to be at peace, calm, not upset and, and, and terribly frustrated with his circumstance. He suffered greatly. We realize that. But where most people would fall apart, um, psychologically they would collapse. Maybe they would fall into a, a state of great depression. Um, perhaps they would become angry and lash out at everyone, become violent and, and bitter. Um, maybe they would even become suicidal. None of that came to, to Job. And we are told that Job's lifestyle before Satan began to afflict him was that he was a good man. He did what the Lord wanted him to do. He was careful to make sure his sons and daughters were following God. He protected um, their, their rightness before the Lord, making sure that, that he um, brought sacrifices and offered for, uh, asked for forgiveness for his children in case they had sinned. He even was so morally pure that he refused to look at women with lust in his heart. So Job, as an as a honest, as an upright man, as a kind and a generous person who l took care of the poor and, and used his, his financial resources to, to help people, this foundation of rightness, of righteousness that had been developed within Job enabled him to rise above the difficulties that he experienced as a deeply wounded and broken individual, not broken within, but broken without. The characteristics that Job had developed over time of obeying God, of following his commands, of doing the things that the Lord has said, of living a righteous life, prepared him for the, for the hardship that he was going to face when, sa saw, when Satan came up against him. The Bible tells us that Job was a, was a righteous and an upright man faithful to God and, um, and right in all he did. That was his character, and it developed within him a personality that was able to rise above great and tremendous difficulties. Now, when it comes to righteousness, the Bible insists that there are forces of evil that are working against us that are doing their best to try to destroy us. Um, they want to crush our faith in God. They want to disconnect us from, from, from Him as our, as our God and our Savior. Um, they try to, to break into our inner world and bring to us despair and despair. their best to destroy our personality. Now, the Bible tells us that we are to, um, to stand firm then, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, stand firm then and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate, the purpose of the breastplate is to, to protect the internal organs, 
most specifically the heart. And when we think of the heart, we're usually, we're often not just thinking of the, the biological machine that pumps blood through our body, but when we talk about the heart, generally we're talking about the inner part of us, that which makes us who we are. When the Bible describes the heart, it's speaking of the personality of the individual, that which is going to continue on after death and, and be you for the rest of time. Your heart is who you are. It's the seed of your emotions, your, your response to, to situations. It is, it is you, how you feel, how you think, how you, the, how you operate, the way you are. So the heart is you. And when God says to put on the breastplate of righteousness, what he's saying is that righteousness is a protection for you, for your emotions, for you psychologically, for you. Now, when we do what God tells us to do, when we obey him, there is a certain protection that that provides for us. When we, um, when we follow his commands, when we forgive people, when we are honest, when we act with integrity, when we, um, when we live purely, when we, we fight against immorality in ourself, um, when, we, um, when we treat e others fairly, when we refuse to look at someone and based upon their outward appearance determine the type of person they are and treat them in a certain way. When, when we are doing what God has told us to do, there is a protection that, God, that that provides us against the spiritual forces of evil that are operating in this world. They can't get at us when our life with God is stable and it's built upon obedience. They can't crush us within when we are doing what God has told us to do. There is a divine mechanism that God provides that when we are living a righteous life, when we are doing what God has told us to do, when we are in fellowship with other Christians, when we are supporting God's ministry through our giving, when we are following God and the commandments that he's given us, when we are doing those things, there is a psychological protection that is provided for us, an emotional protection that is given to us. And that comes through simply just doing what God tells us to do. When we do that, our inner world is guarded from those forces of evil that are coming up against us. If we just took, and I realize that many people don't even really know the Ten Commandments, but if we just took the Ten Commandments found in Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, if we just took those Ten Commandments and started to go through them, take the first commandment, am I living up to what God has told me to do with the first commandment? Is there any part of me that is in a little bit of rebellion, maybe even a large amount of rebellion against the first commandment, the second commandment, the third commandment, the fourth commandment? Am I keeping the Sabbath day holy? Am I honoring my parents? Am I holding any grudges? Am I thinking of people in a way that, that would destroy their, person, their character? What, am I talking about people and ruining their reputation in the community? Work your way through the rest of the commandments. Am I taking from others what belongs to them? Am I stealing credit from people when I should be giving the, the respect and the honor to them for what they have done? Am I wanting what others have? Am I, am I so infatuated with the possessions or the characteristics of somebody else that is that it's making me wish that God had made, put me in a different place and I'm not trusting God with what I've been given. If I just took, if you just took, if we just took the Ten Commandments and worked our way through them, there is a tremendous level of protection that God provides for us in our inner world 
against the forces of evil that are trying to destroy that, that part of us, our heart. Let's just make a commitment this week. I'm going to obey God. Every time I see something that I know the Lord has told me to do, I'm going to follow, follow him. I'm going to do what he has told me to do. What great protection God will offer you when you follow him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we know that there are, tr- there are terrible forces of evil that are at work in this world. There are spiritual forces that are doing their best to try to, to ruin us, to take away our peace, our contentment, our joy. But God, we ask you to build in us your righteousness and help us, Lord, to exhibit that because we know that that is a way that you protect us from the devil's onslaught. We ask you, Lord, to be our strength and our help, that we would follow you regardless of what takes place. God, we need you. We long for you. Help us to live the righteous life. Now, perhaps you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you realize that you've sinned against him, and you want a Savior. You want the gift of eternal life. You want your sins taken away from you. Jesus died to take your sins away. He was crucified that the punishment for sin might be removed from you and that the taint of sin would be taken out of you to make you into a new person. And perhaps today you've decided, I want Jesus Christ to give me the gift of eternal life. I want my sins forgiven. You say to the Lord, Lord, I ask you to forgive my sins. I believe that you died on the cross to take my sins from me. I believe that you rose from the dead and that you're alive and that you have the power to give me eternal life. I ask you, Jesus, to come and be a part of me, to join with me and make me a new person in you. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. 